We take a look at the new movers and shakers of share markets in Shanghai, Hong Kong, and New York. China's Ant Group says it seeks to dual list in Shanghai and Hong Kong. Alibaba's fintech arm is seeking a valuation of more than 200 billion U.S. dollars. Ant Group is the parent company of China's most popular mobile payment platform, Alipay. It's now the world's highest valued fintech company, bigger than WeChat Pay and Apple Pay. It now offers a variety of online financial services for consumers, including payments, banking, brokerages, and wealth management. So, what's behind its decision to list in Shanghai and Hong Kong rather than New York? Some say there are obvious reasons. Others say there are more than just the obvious. Let's loop in our panelists. For more observation of the Asian stocks in Hong Kong, we have Hong Hao, Managing Director and Head of Research at the Broadcom International. In New York, Anthony Chan, former J.P. Morgan Chase Chief Economist. The gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Follow the money. That's what, what they say always, no matter what the weather is like. So tell me, where shall we follow the money? Here on the mainland in Hong Kong or go to the U.S. Uh, stock markets and get listed? Uh, Mr. Hong. Yeah, well, I guess the uh, money is coming this way. Um, so far this year, uh, Hong Kong's IPO market has, has been going banana. And because of that, you know, money is you know, chasing some of the very hot IPOs, and we're seeing very large uh, fund flows going to Hong Kong. Uh -huh. So as a result, uh, Hong Kong dollar uh, strengthens substantially as well, and I think the um, HKM has to intervene. And I think the reason being uh, the rivalry between U.S. and China is escalating. Uh, so it actually makes more sense to get listed in Hong Kong, and more and more increasingly you will see uh, many uh, U.S. listed Chinese companies coming back this way as well. Interesting. Mr. Chen, based in New York, would you agree with your Chinese colleague Hong Kong is the way to go? Well, I think that right now the risk averse uh, uh, position or strategy for many uh, Chinese companies is certainly to list in Hong Kong in the event that they'll have problems uh, in the United States. Uh, but if we want to follow the money, any investor can invest in a Chinese company, whether they were listed in the United States or listed in Hong Kong. There's really not that much of a, a constraint. So if there is a good company uh, out there in Hong Kong or in the U.S., uh, U.S. investors certainly will follow the money and buy it, uh, irrespective of which uh, exchange the company is listed in. Okay. If we look at, in contrast, the numbers of IPOs and the amount raised in other regions, uh, for example, in the Americas, but this is as a whole, the listings and proceeds each fell 30 percent. Meanwhile, the number of listings in Europe fell 47 percent, where proceeds down 48 percent. I'm not trying to say there's only one flower in the world, that is Asia, that is China. I'm just saying the number is showing interesting things, isn't it, Mr. Chan? It certainly is, and one of the reasons, obviously, is that the pandemic uh, has hit the United States a lot deeper. We've had uh, almost 3.8 million cases. Uh, the country has been shut down. When you go to Asia, you see that the, the hit has not been as severe, and in fact, by the end of the year, uh, Chinese uh, real GDP will be higher, uh, growing somewhere in excess of 2 percent, maybe as much as 2.5 percent, while in the United States, the economy will contract overall for the year uh, mm. by close to 5%. So there's clearly stronger economic activity uh, in Asia, and certainly that is being reflected in the equity markets. I don't know about you, uh, Mr. Hong, but I can hear from your colleague, uh, Mr. Chan, suggesting don't be happy too early, uh, it seems, that uh, even though the number <laughs> looks great, but... Uh, you know, long term, is the economy really supporting those numbers and maybe the stock markets are just moody? Uh, well, the market is always moody. Uh, you know, as you can see, the dramatic um, rebound from March low. Um, nothing like this has ever, ever happened before. Uh, I think, you know, in terms of money raised in Hong Kong and also in the Asia market, um, Hong Kong has always been number one or two uh, in the I, I, IPO league table. Uh, so also with the return of many of the Chinese companies, it's actually not surprising at all. Um, regarding the mainland market, though, 
uh, a year ago uh, today, uh, you know, we have this uh, new tech board um, uh, that is um, uh, having a, a listing reform, mm. uh, which now the listing uh, on this board uh, is based on uh, registration phase. So as long as you can fit the listing criteria, you're, you're good quality companies, you can get listed in, in, in this new tech board. Then I think since then, you know, many of the um, uh, uh, high-tech Chinese firms and healthcare firms are, are listed uh, on this board and has been a tremendous success I see. Uh, stories. Uh, right. So, yeah, so I, I would say that I'm not surprised by the money raised. Mm. If you take a look at companies, particularly Ant Financial, that is the one likely to be listed very soon, both uh, in Shanghai and also uh, in Hong Kong. And CEO Eric Jing stressed the benefits of an initial public offerings uh, with the choices like this. Uh, he said, uh, becoming a public company will enhance transparency to our stakeholders, including customers, business partners, employees, shareholders, and regulators. Through our service to serve the underserved, we will make possible for the whole of our society to share our growth. Of course, these are the bigger goals a company set for itself. But looking at uh, Mr. Hong, what is Ian Financial behind its Alibaba and its competitor? Also, we see WeChat Pay. Meanwhile, overseas, there's Apple Pay and PayPal, things like that. So how do you see Ian Financial as a leading company in that field, trying to choose these uh, two places, Shanghai, Hong Kong? Yeah, well, N Financial has uh, grown substantially. I think last time, it, when it was evaluated by private investment groups uh, back in 2018, you know, it was well about uh, 120 billion U.S. dollars. Now, the, you know, I think many uh, is putting the valuation of this deal at about 200 billion, right? So it's it's a very uh, substantial amount, and I think it's it will be ranked one of the largest IPOs uh, mm. ever, especially in Asia. Uh, so I think you know, over the years, um, M Financial uh, has grown into uh, a payment company, a financial service firms, uh, and also you know has a very large uh, fund cash fund management on uh, under. Uh, under it as well. Mr. Chan, a huge amount of money uh, behind uh, this IPO and financial a leading uh, flagship, shall I say, in the field of too. How do you see the international competition? Uh, the map of it as a result of Ant Financial being listed in Shanghai and Hong Kong? Well, I think there is going to be uh, global competition, but Ant Financial uh, is a solid company. I mm -hmm. think they're going to expand even out of uh, China into other Asian uh, economies. They so are. it is definitely uh, a company that one should watch and, and certainly uh, be uh, very excited with their progress because. The world is moving towards fintech solutions and more electronic solutions. Certainly, this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic is going to cause people to be even more excited about using electronic payments uh, than they are using uh, currency. Of course, in China, electronic payments uh, is something that is more common than it is mm -hmm. in the United States. But the United States is going to catch up. Right. Another thing about the latest development is uh, what does that mean for Chinese companies? Earlier, you, both of you touched on a little bit about that. But, you know, Alice has been suggesting that more U.S. listed Chinese companies are actually right now flocking back to Hong Kong or the mainland in China as this U.S.-China tensions rise. Last month, for example, Chinese gaming giant NetEase launched its listing in Hong Kong, raising 2.7 billion U.S. dollars. You've also seen some of the other companies uh, doing similar things. So uh, do you think that will be the way to go? Uh, just following earlier, we have a discussion about uh, the tech world. Are we going to see, once again, in the financial world, one world, two systems, um, namely listing in the U.S. or listing back in China, two very different surviving trends. Mr. Hong. Uh, I would say that um, back then uh, the Chinese firms get, you know, chose to, to go overseas is because you know, when you get listed in, uh, in the U.S. stock exchange, uh, it's, it has this um, sort of a premium image attached to it. Right? So it's a, it has a, a very nice premium cachet. Uh, uh, attached to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think now, and, and also back then, because of the listing rules, uh, you know, it's an approval based system, right? So you have to uh, um, queue up, uh, and you know, there are like hundreds of firms in front of you. And, and whether you get listed in China or not, it really depends on, you know, how early or how late you, know, you get into the queue, mm. which is hugely unfair. 
uh, for many of the firms that is looking for capital for expansion. Uh, so I would say that now the listing reform, so now um, the, the China export also uh, is reforming uh, to be a, a registration-based system as well, uh, same as the new tech board uh, we mentioned just now. So I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, more and more uh, uh, Chinese companies coming back this way. And also, you know, regarding Hong Kong, if, if you still remember a couple of years ago when yeah. Alibaba was choosing between Hong Kong and New York, right? Uh, it, it, it didn't choose Hong Kong because, you know, um, there was the ownership uh, issue. So you uh, uh, same stock, you have the same ownership. Uh, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange insisted that. And then later on last year, I think Hong Kong Stock Exchange reformed that rule as well. So as a result, you know, you, naturally you see more and more companies coming back this way. Mr. Chen, are we going to see Chinese uh, headquarter company coming back to the Chinese stock market and also in Hong Kong? Is that going to be also one world, two systems? We're talking about the French. I really hope not because I, we're in a global world and we have to cooperate. But right now, let's just face the reality, and that is that uh, U.S. regulators are, are requesting that Chinese companies uh, provide uh, more financial uh, data. And, of course, uh, China, uh, companies in China sometimes are, are not permitted to provide the same level of accounting information that U.S. companies provide uh, in the United States. Mm. And so I think until regulators uh, really get together and, and form some sort of a, a compromise, that Chinese companies will gravitate towards Hong Kong. But someday, I, I am confident that uh, regulators in China will allow Chinese companies to provide more information and you'll be, allow more companies uh, to list back uh, uh, in the United States. And, and my dream is that someday even U.S. companies will want to list in in China, and some Chinese companies want to list here. We're one world. There's no need to, to really separate things like that. But, but I agree that right now the tensions, whether it's on a regulatory front or on yeah. the trade front, are pushing us in that direction. But I hope that someday that won't be the case. You know, I've been talking to some of the people in the know regarding China-U.S. relations, gentlemen, over the past few weeks, and people are suggesting before the U.S. general election, the atmosphere is too toxic to nail the details for the positive direction. But after four months, are we going to see any change? That's probably companies have to think about. Anti-China sentiment is sort of bipartisan. Um, so whoever, as we go into the, the U.S. election, you know, the um, rhetoric and, and the uh, rhetoric uh, that is being used by some of the U.S. politicians could, could get even more heated than before. Right. Uh, as we have witnessed just now, uh, recently. Uh, so I would say that it's very difficult to predict, and I think for uh, Chinese companies to get listed in the, in the U.S., they have to prepare for this contingency. Mm. Uh, Mr. Chen? I'm actually more optimistic because I feel that right now, uh, if you look at Mr. Uh, President Trump, uh, his base uh, wants him to be very tough uh, with China, so the rhetoric and perhaps even some of the actions will be aggressive. But if he wins the election, then there's no need uh, because there's not going to be a, a future campaign. If he loses the election and Biden becomes president, uh, he has a history of over 30 years of compromising either with other uh, political parties like Republicans or, in fact, uh, uh, compromising and, and meeting other countries uh, halfway, whether it be Europe, whether it be China. He does have a, a history of, 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 of a compromising demeanor. So I think irrespective of who wins the election, whether it's Trump or Biden, I think that the environment uh, for the U.S. and China tensions will be a lot more positive than they are right now leading up into the elections, when to some extent both uh, candidates have to act as though they're very tough on China for political purposes after the election or immediately after some of that pressure will go away. Mm. So what about uh, uh, in the near future also for these companies? Uh, uh, when they are li being listed, uh, let's just say Chinese companies coming back to China from New York, uh, uh, Shanghai, Hong Kong, how attractive will these uh, exchanges uh, be, these markets be uh, in the future when we see a geopolitical divide, uh, Mr. Hong? Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, investors as well as listed companies are preparing for this 
sort of contingency because it's, it's very predictable, uh, unpredictable. Therefore, you know, you don't want to wake up one day and, and find yourself in, in, a, in a situation. Uh, so I think, you know, for, for future purpose, uh, you know, as you can see, um, the Chinese capital market is undergoing substantial reform. Uh, the trading volume uh, on the Chinese stock exchange now is, you know, one well over one trillion yuan per mm. day, right? So it's, it's a very liquid and, 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 and a, um, a very well participated market. Uh, in terms of Hong Kong, so if you put uh, um, the mainland Asia market and the Hong Kong uh, stock market together, mm. you know, together they are like very close to, you know, the largest in the world. Uh, and also Hong Kong still has a very uh, sort of a, a, a good financial, sound, sort of financial system. Uh, for listed company here as well. So I think all in all, um, I would say that even though the U.S. Uh, market is still one, uh, the largest, but I would say that uh, the Asian uh, markets, especially the Asia and the Hong Kong shares market, competitive. Mr. Chan, of course there are political issues uh, about uh, Hong Kong, whether different sides agrees or not about the latest policy. But China has always said it's an internal issue, not have the interference of the others. Let's just put politics aside. So uh, now how attractive is the Hong Kong markets for investors around the world? I think that right now the Hong Kong market is uh, very attractive because when you look at Hong Kong uh, shares, the Hang Seng Index, on a year-to-day basis is actually down. Uh, when you look at uh, other markets uh, like the uh, Shanghai Equity Market Index, uh, that index uh, is uh, much more uh, favorable in, in terms of its being much higher. Uh, the Hong Kong economy will, in fact, be a little bit weaker. So there's an opportunity for a recovery uh, in the uh, Hong Kong equity market. And by the way, I would say the same thing about the European equity market. Uh, because that market is, is certainly on a year-to-day basis a, a little bit softer. So when I see uh, equity markets that are down and mm -hmm. I, I look to the future and I think things may be improving, uh, that gives me some, uh, some hope. I see. Uh, and uh, it makes me feel there's value there. On the other hand, both of you gentlemen, what about uh, stock markets inside the United States, uh, New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ? Uh, of course, uh, Mr. Chen, you're in New York. Uh, you know that... Uh, as a result of the pandemic, uh, the stock market uh, pretty much uh, hit by that, even though the markets are doing quite well uh, if you look at the investors' income. So how do you see this uh, quite mixed signal? What's likely to be the near future for markets inside the United States? I think the markets in the United States will do just fine. I mean, you can see that the S&P 500 uh, uh, is up from the lows uh, in March, March 23rd. It's yeah. up over 45%. So it clearly shows you that there is uh, a considerable amount of optimism in, in, the, uh, in the equity markets in the United States. And of course, uh, eventually profits will in fact pick up, not right away. S&P 500 profits probably won't go back to the profits we saw mm -hmm. in 2019 until two, until. Uh, maybe 2022, but they're moving in the right direction, certainly over the next 12 months. And, I see. and that, I think, will give some positive breath to the market. Mr. Hong, agree or not? Uh, yeah, well, I oh, think the, uh, the U.S. market is <laughs> <laughs> very, very strong, uh, very strong. I think there's no denial about it, um, you know, because of the tremendous amount of liquidity that uh, the Fed is pumping into the system. Uh, and also, you know, the U.S. tech company is indeed, you know, leading uh, in, in many areas as well. So I think, you know, there's quite a bit for the rest of the world to catch mm. up um, uh, to that kind of uh, high-tech standard. Uh, I think besides that, though, uh, one has to be sort of um, be mindful that uh, the U.S., uh, especially the, the NASDAQ uh, composite, uh, is trading at a very high valuation, right? So no one has ever seen this valuation before, uh, you know, unless you're, you're back in March 2000. Now, you know, one can argue that um, because of the Fed's uh, liquidity uh, operation, therefore, you know, uh, stocks can trade at a higher multiple. Um, but, you know, it remains to be seen, you know, whether when you're entering into a very slow growth, earnings growth um, yes. period, um, even though you have very good liquidity conditions, uh, whether, you know, that is enough to support such high valuation. Okay, Hong Hao, Anthony Chan, what a pleasure talking to both of you. Be safe. And we hope we will still follow the money.
Thank you so much. And that's all we have for today. If you'd like to see more, you can certainly search our program, World Insight. Check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Ken Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.